sleeping under a rock the last 20 years, you're probably well aware that there's a rap have been a rapid growth in the bioethanol industry produced from grain. In fact, today about 30% of the corn production in the United States or more goes into the production of ethanol. One of the byproducts of that ethanol production is distiller's grains uh, with solubles. And because of their availability and because of the lower availability of corn that's out there for feed, today we're using a lot of wet distiller's grains in our feed yard diets. However, most of the work's been done in the northern plains because that's where the, most of the, distil but the ethanol plants are located. Very little work's been done in the southern plains where we tend to feed a different type diet than in the northern plains. Of course, there's very uh, great interest in the potential effects of animal feeding operations on the environment, as well as uh, we need to know what the effects of feeding these distiller's grains are uh, on the environment as well. So we uh, developed several, of, two objectives anyway, for these studies. Oh, I forgot to mention, I should have thanked my co-authors, especially Kristen Hales, who's now located at the meat, located at the Meat Animal Research Center, since actually she did all the work here, and I'm just taking credit for it, I guess you could say. But anyway, we want to determine the effects of corn processing method, because in the northern plains and corn belt, corn tends to be dry rolled when it's fed, whereas in Colorado, Kansas, and Texas, in Oklahoma, most of the times the corn is steam flaked. So it makes a very big difference in the, in the corn you're feeding. So we know the effects of steam flaking and the effects of wet distiller's grain inclusion rate on metabolic carbon dioxide production and enteric methane production from, uh, typical, from cattle fed typical finishing diets. Uh, we did two experiments uh, using respiration calorimetry. In experiment one, we used four Jersey steers that weighed about 200 kilograms in a four by four Latin square design. The treatments were arranged in a two by two factorial in which there were two grain processing methods, either steam flaked or dry rolled, and two inclusion levels of wet distiller's grains, either zero or 30% of the diet dry matter. If you're not familiar, wet distiller's grains are about 30% dry matter, so it's a very wet product. So we end up with four treatments. These are our treatment combinations, a steam flake corn with no distillers, steam flake corn with 30% distillers, dry roll with no distillers, or dry roll corn with 30% distillers. The diets were, ba were balanced for what we call ruminally degradable protein, which is the fraction of the protein that we believe is degraded in the rumen and does not pass through the rumen. And in, for this, these trials, we used a value of about 8% for ruminal degradable protein. We also balanced the diets for total fat content. And in some studies, they don't do this, but we balance for total fat because in the southern Great Plains, we tend, tend to add some fat to our receiving diets. They don't in the northern plains, but we do in the southern plains. But we look for a total fat content of 6 to 6.8% in these diets. In experiment two, we used another uh, four Jersey steers. This time they weighed about 300 kilograms. Again, a four by four Latin square design. And the four treatments were wet distiller's grains at inclusion levels of zero, 15, 30, or 45% of diet dry matter. At the lower inclusion levels, we were able to balance for ruminal degradable protein. At the higher inclusion levels, that's not practical. And similarly, for the ether extract or the fat, at low inclusion levels of distiller's grains, we can balance for fat. But when we get high levels of distiller's grains, which are very high in fat, they're 10 to 12% fat, it's hard to balance down at these lower levels. The procedures in both experiments were essentially the same. Uh, each period of the Latin square was 21 days in length. The first 16 days was essentially a period to adapt for the animals to adapt to their diets and the feeding levels. I will say all the animals in the experiment were fed at two times their maintenance energy requirement. And we didn't have any problem with feed intakes or losing feed intake. The animals were put in the chambers for the last five days where we did a total fecal and urine collection and a gas exchange. Uh, air flow through the, the chambers, again, these were open circuit chambers, so we brought in fresh air at a rate of about 300 liters per minute, 
then the, the air coming in, the air coming out of the chamber was analyzed for carbon dioxide, methane, and oxygen. Uh, we used infrared analyzers for the carbon dioxide and methane. I'm not going to talk about the energy metabolism work today, so won't worry about the oxygen uh, consumption. The data were analyzed using proc mix of SAS as, uh, again, it's four by four Latin squares. These are the ingredient compositions of the diets we fed. Obviously, when we added distiller's grains, we substituted the distiller's grains for part of the corn. We also removed cottonseed meal, which is part of the protein supplement. We had a little bit, we reduced the amount of fat in the diet, and we, we uh, removed the molasses. In many cases, we used molasses to help tie the diets together, but with these very high uh, distiller's grains byproducts, we don't need that extra moisture from the molasses or other products that helps tie the rations together. And this is the nutrient composition of the diets. And as you would expect, when we added the distiller's grains, we increased the crude protein level in the diet from about 13% up to about 17%. We also lowered the starch content in the diet because we were taking out corn, replacing it with a low starch byproduct. We also increased the fiber, because that's very high in the distiller's grains. The uh, ether extract or fat was similar across diets. The calcium, we balanced for calcium. And as you would expect, because distiller's grains are high in phosphorus and sulfur, when we added 30% distiller's grains, we essentially increased the phosphorus by about 50%, and we essentially doubled the sulfur content in our total diets. Let me see, but oh yeah, these are these are very typical in finishing diets. Yes, because mm -hmm. we're feeding we're feeding seventy to eighty percent grain diets. Yes, no, <laughs> we have learned how to manage that. So we don't, uh, and we use some feed additives like rumensin that are probably helpful in reducing that. Also, by but by feeding technologies or fe feeding management, we actually kind of even out the feed intake during the day so animals don't get to engorge and beca become acidotic. We do get some acidosis, but it's, yeah, yeah. In experiment two, these are the diets we used. Again, as you would expect, as we increase the amount of distiller's grains in the diet, we reduce the amount of corn. Again, all these diets were based on steam flake corn. We increased the distiller's grains, took out the cottonseed meal, reduce the amount of yellow grease, which was our fat source, and took out the molasses again. And again, as you would expect, as we increase the distiller's grains in the diet, we increase the crude protein content, reduce the starch content, increase the fiber, increase the phosphorus, and increase the sulfur content of the diets. Now again, in this case, at the lower inclusion levels, we were able to balance for fat, but the higher inclusion levels, that was not practical. This is a steer, by the way, in the, the chambers with the fecal bag, and we have a tray below that collects the urine. We looked at apparent digestibilities of the different feed ingredients, and I'll go through most of this uh, pretty rapidly. Essentially, when we use dry, ro dry rolled corn, we tended to see slightly higher digestibility of our crude protein, but a uh, as we would typically expect a much lower digestibility of the starch. Essentially, when we steam flake or corn, we take a product that's about 85% digestible and make it almost 100% digestible. So that's why in the Southern Plains, for years, we've had what you might say expensive corn, cheap natural gas. So we used the natural gas to reduce the amount of corn we needed. And in the Northern Plains, they had high natural gas, cheap corn. So they didn't, they didn't have to worry about it so much. Again, fiber digestibility was, I don't know why we got, saw this difference. There are probably a number of reasons. But again, with the distiller's grains, again, we saw a higher digestibility of the fiber in the distiller's grains. But in the second study, we saw just the opposite. So uh, this, we're looking at the daily methane and carbon dioxide production. And I'm looking, uh, again, dry matter intakes were similar for all the treatments. And if we look at methane production, whether we look at liters per day, 
liters per kilogram of dry matter intake. Uh, methane production is energy per as a percent of gross energy of the diet, of gross energy intake, or as a percent of the digestible energy in the intake. When we steam flake the corn, we reduced our enteric methane pr production by about 20%. But in this case, feeding distillers grains, we had no effect on enteric methane production. There are some other data that will disagree with this, but there are reasons why they tend to disagree. And again, remember, in these two diets, we have essentially the same fat content in those diets. Nitrogen balance, I'm going to skip over that real fast for time. Again, digestibilities, as we increase the amount of distiller's grain in experiment two, we reduce the, the digestibility of our energy and uh, of the, the fiber. Again, as, as far as methane, enteric methane production, we actually saw linear increases in methane production as we increased the amount of distiller's grain in the diet. Now, again, we were looking at linear and quadratic effects. If we went in and did some kind of a multiple range test, like a Duncan's, we would probably say that 0 to 15 and maybe even up to 30, there was no significant difference. But when we got to 45% distiller's grains, then we saw a significant uh, increase in methane production from about 70 liters per day up to about 102 liters per head per day. Again, the nitrogen intake, as you might expect, as we increase nitrogen intake, we increase urinary nitrogen excretion. Primarily, that's the primary route of increased excretion of nitrogen. Now, we took these data and we put them into a, a very simplified LCA, you might say, and we looked at, uh, to try to get a Foot a hold of what is the carbon footprint when we steam flake corn, when we feed distillers grains. These are the assumptions we made. So we were looking at an estimate of nitrous oxide emissions, ammonia emissions, carbon dioxide, and methane emissions. In the first trial, if we just look at the effects of feeding steam flake corn versus dry roll corn, if we look at the input of natural gas, which is required to steam flake the corn, and here I, could, I used a global warming potential of either 1, because we converted all the methane to CO2, or of 21, which would be your uh, global warming potential of the original methane. So we've got a range here. But we look, because of lower enteric methane production with steam flaking, we reduced that part of the carbon footprint. Manure, because we excreted less volatile solids onto the thin surface, we would reduce the manure methane. Uh, we had a slight effect there on direct emissions of nitrous oxide and indirect uh, emissions of nitrous oxide. Because we use less corn when we feed uh, steam flake corn, uh, the crop production uh, carbon footprint is slightly lower. So when we add all these up, we actually, although we're using a fossil fuel to steam flake the corn when we calculate it, we actually seem to lower our carbon footprint a little bit when we steam flake the corn over feeding dry roll corn. And then we took the data from the second experiment, again, looked at different levels, uh, the four different levels of distiller's grains. Again, natural gas use was, was slightly decreased because we were steam flaking less corn as we increased the amount of distiller's grain in the diet. Enteric methane went up. Manure methane went up slightly because, again, we're excreting more volatile solids on the pen surface. Because of the higher nitrogen intake, N2O emissions, increased when we fed distillers grains. But we, and the crop production, because we're using less corn, the amount of corn, the carbon footprint of the corn that goes in the diets is less. Now, I'm making an assumption here that if any of y'all are in the ethanol industry, I'm giving y'all, or making you take all of the carbon footprint from the corn to make the distillers grains. And so the carbon footprint that I'm using for distillers grains here is zero. Figuring we're just we're taking a waste product and getting rid of it. Now there would be a little transportation charge there, which I have not included, and that you can question that assumption, and that could be definitely questioned. But that's the assumption I'm making in these calculations. When I add them all up, essentially the feeding zero to 45 percent distillers grains didn't really have much of an effect in this with using this example, these figures on the total carbon footprint of feeding cattle. And this is based on a single animal 
being fed for 150 days. I'm sorry, that's, this is a kilogram CO2 equivalent. So in conclusion, I can say that cattle consuming steam flake corn-based uh, finishing diets produce less enteric methane and retain more energy than cattle fed dry roll corn-based diets. Also, inclusion of distillers grains at 15 to 30 percent of the dietary dry matter in steam flake corn-based diets, anyway, have little effect on enteric methane production. Uh, again, that's when diets are balanced for total fat. If you're, low in the, if you're increasing the fat in the diet by adding distillers grains, that's probably not true. You're probably lowering your methane emissions. Inclusion of wet, wet distillers grains at 45 percent of the diet had a significant effect uh, increase on enteric methane production. This is probably, this is despite the higher fat, and it's probably just because of a, a low digestible fiber that we're adding to the diet in place of starch. Steam flaking corn surprisingly lowered the carbon footprint compared to dry rolling corn, uh, primarily due to its effects on enteric methane production and the total corn crop that's required. The, and despite higher enteric methane and nitrous oxide emissions, Inclusion of distiller's grains in the diets they had little effect really on the carbon footprint. At 15 and 30 percent, we might have said there was actually a small numeric decrease, but at 45 percent, a small numeric increase. And again, that's assuming that the carbon footprint for the distiller's grains is zero coming into the feed yard. Yeah, um, I can't recall from your diet sheet, but uh, the distiller's grain substitute. Part of that was corn, part of it was cottonseed meal, which is a protein supplement, uh, part of also the, some urea, and the, some of the fat. So your, um, your carbon footprint analysis uh, did not include uh, the reduced carbon footprint of the substituted ingredients. So you could, no. you could allocate the carbon footprint well, for the corn that well, let me see if I back up. I think actually, because we, we, we got a carbon footprint for corn production here, crop production. So as we, as we replace corn with distiller's grains here, we, we have a lower footprint for the corn and the other ingredients that went into the diet. That's what we're looking at here, uh, am I, am I, if I'm getting your question well, correct. Well, uh, when, when you put distiller's grain in, you took corn out. Correct. So Right. Well, essentially, yeah, that's what we're seeing here. Is that that drop in that number is the plus you're talking about? It took less corn, so it about 50 uh, kilograms less CO2 equivalent, for example, because we use less corn in this diet. 